Whether it's bad planning, bad luck, bad timing, or bad inventions, well-intentioned bad decisions have plagued history for thousands of years. Welcome to Historic Hindsight. Hello and welcome to another episode of Historic Hindsight. I'm John, that's Tom, and today we're going to talk to you about the great American hero, Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, that's... That's right, Johnny. I'm, I'm hesitating on the, the hero great, part. Great American hero, right? Because I know him from our textbook, so he must Yeah, be. well, and I'm going to and I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and admit that, like, outside of, like, knowing what he did in World War I, which was pretty shady, and I knew that, like, I didn't know a lot else about Woodrow Wilson. Ah, so, so he was our president during was, World War I, apparently. He, yeah, he was. There we go. Uh, so this research is, is it, it has very enlightening and, and while, and I'm just going to go ahead and say, while some statues are being toppled down, maybe needlessly, <laughs> maybe not needlessly, like, I'm confused as to why his name is still on things and why he still has statues. Because, uh, th- well, there are some you can deny. Like, some things people do, you can deny and be like, all right, well, it was a product of the times or something. You can come up with an excuse. Sure. I don't, I don't, well, we'll get there, Johnny. If you don't know who Woodrow Wilson is... He was a 28th president of these United States of America who literally rewrote history. And I mean, literally rewrote history to suit his needs. Well, you uh, asked why he had things named after him. When you're writing history, well, Tommy, well, there you, go, you can, right? you can uh, shine a pretty good light on yourself. And, uh, and he did lead us through World War I by rewriting the Constitution so that you could not speak out against World War I. Ah, well, nothing like a little stripping your freedom of speech. Right, who needs who needs freedom of speech? <laughs> and oh man, his foreign policies. They uh they like I'm gonna exaggerate a little bit, but pretty much every problem that we have with the United States, kinda Wilson's fault. Yeah, we can we can trace it back. He he's got his Still, fingers in every naughty little thing we got going on. Yes, and we will go there. Now, he did do some good stuff, but I don't care about his good stuff. I'm no. only focusing on his bad. Yeah, broken clocks and all that, you know. Yeah, broken clocks, yeah. And his good stuff wasn't really when he was president. It was when he was uh, governor. So it, it, he didn't have enough time as governor to do the bad stuff. So well, we'll, and, and if, you're, you know, if your end goal is presidency, you do have to be at least a, a passable governor in order to get that position. So I'm guessing right. a lot of it was just kind of him fronting to get what he wanted. Yeah, and, and I'm going to go ahead and start with his ancestry because, well, Johnny, you're always a product of where you're born. You know, most – if you're, right. your, your politics are usually derived from your parents' politics, it's usually derived from your grandparents' politics. Sure. Which is, which is interesting. Uh, but then there are cases where things kind of go awry, and it's important to understand his ancestry. So uh, his grandfather uh, on his dad's side was actually an, an immigrant, so first-generation immigrant. He was uh, – from Scottish and Irish descent on both his dad and his mom's side. His paternal grandfather named James Wilson would immigrate to Steubenville, Ohio from Ireland. God, why he picked Ohio, I don't know, but I guess... A job market, maybe? I don't know. I, I, I really I, I mean, don't know. I, there's probably plenty of land to just go ahead and take what <laughs> yeah, you want. And... It is Ohio. <laughs> I'm just going to live here now. Well, and I did find through census maps and stuff through like the, the, the elections and the electoral colleges, Ohio is actually one of the most populated states at this time, which is oh, no weird. Kidding. Yeah. Like you had like, if you won New York and Ohio, like you, That's you it. won the election pretty much. So is it, was it farming at the time or I, I industry? Don't, like, was there industry? Maybe well, because I, of I'd the, riv- the be rivers. Well, and... You've got Cincinnati, you've got the, you got the Ohio river there. Yeah. So you've got, you've got Cincinnati as a big, huge hub of, right. hub of industry. So I'm going to go ahead and say a combination. Well, and then, uh, yeah, and then up in the north, north, you can get, yeah. get stuff with lakes, you know, with, uh, lake, lakes and they, with but they uh, did have a pretty good, pretty good, you know, population back then. Uh, his grandfather would, uh, would form a pro tariff anti slavery newspaper called the Western Herald and Gazette. So, okay. Yeah. We're, uh, we're an Irish immigrant. And that takes a lot because you're an Irish immigrant who's being shit on by all the other white people. Right. Yeah. And you're like, these slaves have it rough. I know. And, well, and, and I, tariffs are a good thing. Well, and I feel like at a certain point being abused is going to grant you some amount of empathy towards other people that are being abused. At least a little bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, he, basically he's everything that the South isn't. So, you know, we're, we're right here in the, uh, the early 1800s. 
His father, Joseph Ruggles Wilson, would be born in Ohio in Steubenville, and he would even write some anti-slavery articles himself. That is until he moved to Staunton, Virginia, where he went to teach at Hamden Sydney uh, College. And well, when you're in Virginia, so real real quick about the newspaper articles. I know that sounds really really impressive that people were writing these articles and stuff. But going <laughs> back and looking through what articles were being written in some of these old newspapers and everything, it, I mean, it was modern. It was you know, I guess not modern day. It was for them. It was their modern day version of Twitter basically yeah and you, anybody, you wrote whatever you wanted and you sent it in and they're gonna put it in the newspaper well and it's not like his dad didn't own a newspaper which helps yeah which was also a you know anti-slavery pro-tariff newspaper so i mean it's not like his, his daddy was gonna let him put anything else in there <laughs> he's just churning out articles for the machine at this point but he did move down to Staunton, Virginia. He was a teacher like i said at hamden sydney college and he started to get infused with the Southern way of life. Thomas Woodrow Wilson would be born in Staunton on December 28th, 1856, a little bit before the Civil War. Uh, and shortly after that, Joseph would become a Presbyterian pastor in Virginia. So now he's a preacher in the South at the height of slavery. He seems like a fairly malleable person. Yeah, yeah, his dad was. <laughs> uh, by the time by the time Joseph would move his family down into Georgia, he was full pro-slave, owned slaves, helped cause a split in the Presbyterian church over slavery in which he was the pro-slave side because the Presbyterian church is like, Jesus probably is not cool with you having <laughs> slaves. And he's all like, no, it says in the Bible about the logistics of buying and selling slaves. Well, but yeah, but that's the Old Testament. Jesus is, what? No, 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 no. Bible. Let, let me go ahead. I'll show you the verses that I want to follow. And I will use them. And then that's just for me. And also this whole like, you know, Jesus said, love your neighbor and everything. At that time, were the blacks really considered neighbors? So do you have to love them? I don't know. It's hard to say. You know, it's a, it's a gray area. Yeah, you know? Just to clarify for the listeners at home, this is satire. Yes, Johnny well, doesn't actually believe that. I, I'm just saying at the time. At the time, this is what his that, argument. That is the ludicrous argument that one might make. Exactly. So he caused a split between the Presbyterian Church over the slavery. Uh, he identified as a Confederate during the Civil War, and he treated wounded Confederates at his church. But Johnny, it's all good because he allowed the slaves that he owned to attend Sunday school because, you know, they needed Jesus in their life. So well, how about that? All's, all's forgiven? I mean, basically, he's, he's educating slaves is what you're, you're telling me, which I, I think was a pretty big no-no. So really, he was a fairly progressive slave owner, some might argue. Oh there definitely would be some that would argue that he was a I mean, I'm, I'm not, owner, I guess. I'm not going to be the one arguing that, but you know, some might. So obviously growing up in this environment had a little impact on Thomas Woodrow Wilson, which by the way, did you know his first name was Thomas? I had no idea his first name was Thomas. No, why, why wouldn't he, why would he not go by Thomas? That's I don't like know. One of the I, best I, I, American no. names ever. As far to be as fair, I'm, I'm glad he didn't go by Thomas. I don't <laughs> want my name tainted on this, <laughs> this legacy, but uh yeah, and, and I couldn't find out why he changed it. He just, he kind of always went by Woodrow. I'm going to guess that uh, alliteration lends itself well to public offices. It makes it easier to remember, and it just sounds and flows better than Thomas yeah, Wilson. Woodrow Wilson sounds. Yeah, it does. I could, I could, and he, well, we'll get there. So obviously growing up in the South during the Civil War uh, had an impact. Uh, growing up in the South during Reconstruction had an impact. So... Sure. Woody Wilson there uh, very much was in defense of slavery, thought it was a good institution. Uh, and he was a little embarrassed and hated the Confederacy for losing. So, well, I mean, he wasn't alone that, there. Like a lot of Southerners. And he strongly felt that Reconstruction was aimed directly at the South to destroy the South's way of life. Well, I'll spoil this for anybody at home who <laughs> believes that. It wasn't. It most definitely <laughs> wasn't. Now, I'm not saying that there weren't a few union guys who went a little haphazard, but it most definitely was not aimed at destroying the Southern way of life. Unless by Southern way of life, you mean the ability to buy and sell people. Yes, that's what they mean, Tom. I mean, <laughs> clear, obviously, that's what they mean. In any case... He also had a major fear of the federal government because of, well, you know, 
everything that was going around them and everything that's being taught all, to this poor kid. Yeah, them telling the states not to own slaves. Like, what, who the hell are they, right? States' rights. <laughs> states' rights. That's right, Johnny. That's right. And we'll get there because uh, he would graduate from Princeton in 1879 because he's not <laughs> – some wealthy little prick that can go to Princeton. Although actually at this point in time, Princeton's not the best university in the world, but anyways, he would graduate with a poli sci and history major, which is a, actually a relatively new thing at this point in time, especially in the United States, getting a U.S. history degree when the country is like 10 years old. Like, yeah. What? On. Yeah. What, we had one more. <laughs> like, what do you <laughs> well, mean? Well, history? we had a couple. <laughs> well, especially if you count the Indian ones. Who counts? We those? had a bunch of those. Who, who counts those? Those are, those are <laughs> conflicts with savages, Tommy. They're not wars. We still don't. We still don't. Modern history class. All, all of these people just coming in and taking over this land that God gave to these Europeans that were coming over. Like, what, what are they doing? Sleeping in those beds and houses and trade routes that they had. Nonsense. It's like that Eddie Izzard stand up. This land is our land. It's free. There's nobody here. What? Who are you? What, what are you doing here? I said, this land is free. <laughs> There's nobody to be seen. Miles around. What well, do you oh, flag? Man. He attempted to go to law school in Virginia, but he always had, uh, he would have lifelong struggles with strokes. So oh. I guess I share a name with this dude. And I <laughs> guess I go. share strokes with this dude, but, I mean, but that's guys, about where it ends. You're, you're kind of starting to seem like kindred spirits to me. <laughs> I trust me, I, I am not. Uh, but he would actually go on to pass the Georgia Bar in 1882, even without attending law school. Uh, and he attempted to practice law, but failed in less than a year because, well, I mean. I mean, it seems to me like the Georgia Bar was probably pretty freaking easy to pass <laughs> if he could do it without going. To, you should not be able to pass a law exam without going to school. Going to law school? Yeah, probably not. In 1883, Wilson would marry the love of his life, Ellen Louise Axon, whom he would have numerous affairs on because, well, you know, love of his life. In fact, this was bite him in his ass when he's president, when she would actually wind up passing away of illnesses during his term of presidency. A bunch of love letters came out from him and his mistress. And he was like, yep, I did that. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to marry this other girl who I've been secretly engaged with who's not <laughs> on those love letters. So he had himself a nice little love triangle in the White House. So he's not, so Bill Clinton wasn't the first is all I'm saying. Well, I mean, yeah, it seems like we might have a long line of uh, – or be starting a long line of presidents having affairs and multiple mistresses and being generally horrible people. Right. In 1883, he went to John Hopkins University to become a professor. That's – go to do his graduate school and he said he did this because and i quote a professorship was the only feasible place for me the only place that would afford leisure for reading and for the original work the only strict strictly literary birth with an income attached so those who can't do <laughs> teach there you go he basically I mean, said i just want to be a lazy intellectual and get yeah. paid so teaching sounds like the path for me yeah, I like reading. You'll pay me, and I just have to show up to a class every once in a while and hand out some grades? Yeah, I think I can do that. How hard can it be? He'd graduate with a poli-sci master's in 1885, which was the first given out at, uh, at the John Hopkins University, uh, where he focused more on theory, Johnny, than true historical fact, because he liked the ideas of what-ifs a hell of a lot more than what actually happened. I mean, to be fair, who doesn't? Okay, yeah, but <laughs> – I mean. <laughs> the the problem comes like, is when you try to, and we're going to get right in there with his writings. The problem comes when you try to pass off your theories as what actually happened. Well, I don't, I'm not sure that is a problem for the white man. <laughs> well, like, have you, not, are you familiar with history textbooks? Tommy? <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> and, and Woodrow is a part of this. So his thesis paper during his master's, was was about the was called the congressional government in which he argued that the current separations of power were only an ideal and he complained about the weakness of the presidency or the executive branch lay in the groundwork for what he actually does when he gets into the executive branch he claims that it's weak and has no power but when he's in there all of a sudden he's able to do whatever the fuck he wants well it's weak and has no power but it needs more power right <laughs> like that's what he's saying like why would you why would you cripple this most powerful position in our country when I want to be that eventually. And I would like unlimited power, please. 
Uh, he loathed primary historical sources, Johnny. Said, hey, if it was a firsthand account, I don't want to hear about it. Wait. And didn't use them in his thesis. That's not, that's not how things work. <laughs> primary sources are the most important and best sources. Uh, he wasn't a big fan of secondary sources either, but that was the primary you know, part of his research for his thesis was secondary sources. You know, so dudes writing about things that happened instead yeah, of dudes like, that were actually there. Right, like the Bible. Like the Bible. <laughs> Damn it, Johnny. <laughs> Our three <laughs> listeners are going to alienate a couple of them. Well, He's I don't written know. 400 that. years after Jesus died. I mean, what do you want from me? It was a secondary. It was all yes, hearsay. The Bible was a secondary source. You're all right. All, that's all I'm saying. Uh, over the next few years, he would jump from teaching contract to teaching contract until he landed in Princeton in 1890. In 1902, he would become the president of Princeton University, and he would publish his history books. And I'm, if you're not watching on YouTube, I'm going to air quote that. History books. Well, his story books. Yes, is that what exactly. He, is that what he did? Yeah, yeah. His, and, then, his history... and then it just got confused and... People took out the space, and, and he's like, oh, shit, those were supposed to just be my made-up stories. And right. Now it's history? Ah, oh, shoot. It's, now it's history, yep. It is a, it's titled A History of the American People, where a large part of his whole book is arguing about the good aspects of slavery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you it, do. There, I mean, nobody can argue – from the slave owner side of things that there aren't good aspects to slavery. You can get a lot of stuff done and it doesn't cost you money and you know, or as much money and you don't have to pay them. And there's a lot of good things that come from it, except for the whole, you know, human beings being involved. There's not really right? a downside. He argued at this point that it wasn't slavery that built the nation, but the manifest destiny, the idea that we need to spread from ocean to ocean. And how did, they, how, how were they able to do that so quickly? Was it just just this this white willpower that they had? Slavery. <laughs> oh, oh, right, yeah. That that little little bit of history. There is that little bit of history that we like to forget about. He argued that the that the the South seceded because of states' rights and tariffs, and that Reconstruction was punitive to the Southern way of life. Now, if you're sitting at home thinking, "Well, man, this really sounds familiar," it it should because it's what's called lost cause revisionism, Johnny. And lost cause revisionism is when post-Civil War, people like Woodrow Wilson, and he was one of the first predominant ones of it. I'm not saying he invented this idea, right, but, but he, he was brought one it of the to light. more popular ones to bring it to light. If you say the South seceded only because of slavery, it puts them in a bad light. Like you only fought your own people because you wanted to keep other people indentured. Like that's right. That yeah, sounds bad. So you come yeah. up with these things like we did it because the federal government was opposing its will on the states and the states have the right to govern themselves. Except what is it that they're governing? What is it that they're right that they're fighting for? Oh yeah, slavery. <laughs> I mean, yeah. The tariffs. Oh, the tariffs are so punitive to us because it, you know, we have to pay on manufactured goods coming into the United States and 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 so it was cheaper for us to buy the manufactured goods from England than it was to produce them here at home. Sure. Because all of our slave labor is going into picking cotton, not, right. you know, and industrial anything. manufacturing yeah, in the not South. anything else. So the tariffs are horribly hurting the South because we don't have the manufacturing in the South. And you don't have the manufacturing in the South because you're, you know, agrarian. And, 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 and you like to plant things because you own slaves. And it turns out it makes it real easy when you don't have to do any of the planting or harvesting. So the tariffs hurt you because you own slaves. Right, but that's not what it's about, Tom. And it's, I'm going to point about out them hurting them. And I'm going to point out two things, and then I'm going to get off the whole lost cause bullshit rant. So first, if tariffs were really why the South seceded, why didn't they do it when the tariffs were actually implemented in 1830? You're going to wait 20 plus years, 30 years? I mean, they probably just didn't notice them for that oh, right? period of time. It's just some things slip under the table. Life gets busy. You know that. You know how it was back in the 1840s. And if slavery wasn't the single cause of your revolution and your secession, then why is slavery mentioned in every single secession document? <laughs> like <laughs> South Carolina, the first state to secede. But, it's mentioned like 50 times in there. 
Can Articles just, of Secession. Can we just blame like a like copy and paste command or something? Like they were just copying and pasting the the secession documents or and probably and if you actually go back and read firsthand accounts from the civil war from confederates that were actually fighting the people who actually seceded the 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 congressman who made that decision do you know why they said that they were fighting the war johnny because lincoln was gonna take our slaves hey okay but you you said those were like the primary sources right who the hell uses primary sources when they're doing <laughs> research tommy <laughs> What did the people who heard those people say that thing had to say? That's who I want to talk to. So he helped further the lost cause, Johnny. Not only did he help further the lost cause, but he also helped spur Jim Crow laws in the South because he approved them. He would approve them when he's in the White House, Johnny. And if you're not familiar with what Jim Crow laws are, they're the, you know, you have to go and sit over there and the white people sit over here and you drink out of that water fountain and we drink out of this water fountain. Yeah, that's your Jim Crow laws. Yeah, the whole separate, but separate but equal. Separate but equal, yep. But uh, yep. separate was the important yeah. part of those Jim Crow yeah, laws. Separate is, the, <laughs> separate is very much they, the they important part of those laws. They didn't laws. pay too close attention to that equal bit. Uh, when Cambridge would put together their textbook for, for U.S. history called the Cambridge History of America, they would – Wilson at this point is such a predominant historian, quotes, that they asked him to write the chapter leading up to the Civil War. Why did the South secede? You write the chapter. Do you know what that <laughs> chapter is titled, Johnny? Uh, I'm guessing slavery caused the Civil War. No, it's states' rights. What? And what oh. she – Details every single point of lost cause revisionism for the lead up to the Civil War chapter in, in the Cambridge History of America. I'm guessing slavery was probably not mentioned very many times in this chapter. Yeah. And you know all those statues that went up about Southern people and all that fun stuff, like Southern generals and things? Yeah. You know yeah. That, yeah, that started all the ones happening. That, all the ones getting torn down now? Yeah, that started happening uh, right around now. Huh. In the early 1900s. That's a when weird coincidence. Woodrow Wilson would be writing all this shit. What a weird coincidence ah, that is. It is a weird coincidence, isn't it? Sometimes timing works against you. Now, if you're sitting here thinking I'm picking on Woodrow Wilson, thinking that maybe he's, you know, he's not really a bigot. He was just raised in the South. So he's, you know, I, you could maybe make the argument that he wasn't racist. It's just a product of his culture. And Which, okay, that's fine. You can say he's a product of his culture, but when your culture is racist... And you're a product of that. You 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 are racist. <laughs> like, yes, but but, but basically, what people are saying when they say things like that are, I don't blame you for being racist, but you're racist. racist. Well, if you thought that maybe his bigotry only extended to to former slaves, no, 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 Johnny. In his history books, history of American people, these are quotes. <laughs> when he's describing ing immigrants, he says. They're men of the lowest class from Italy and of the meaner sort from Hungary and Poland and men out of ranks where there are neither skill nor energy nor initiative of quick intelligence. And they came in numbers, sordid, hapless elements of their population. The men whose standards of life and work are such of American workmen had never remained hitherto. So he's Your just fucking another... grandfather was one of those immigrants from Ireland. He's just another old man complaining about lazy immigrants. <laughs> yeah, like that's yeah. that's all he's that's all he's doing. He's being he's being old white man complaining about other people. Uh, he would go on to to support and expand the whole American ex exceptionalism ideals, uh, and he wrote that America was the New Jerusalem and had a duty, Johnny, a duty to spread its ideals across the globe. Don't like that. Yeah, you don't like that. <laughs> now, don't like that at all. While president of Princeton, the students, the board of trustees, and pretty much the faculty, because, well, he fired all the faculty and then brought – well, anyways. Well, that's so what you do. You, you, you students, fill it with your own people. Yeah, the, the board of trustees and the students hated him. They <laughs> protested him on multiple occasions. <laughs> He went to the papers and said, no, 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 they don't like me because I am a revisionist. Ah. They don't like me. And since I have great oratory skills and I may know some people in the newspaper industry, he got the people on his side that are not in Princeton. 
Now, the problem I have with this is if you're sitting at home and let's say, for instance, I know it's not true, but let's say, for instance, Trump is loved in Canada. <laughs> but if the people in the United States don't like him, maybe listen to the people that he's actually governing over and not the people that he's not governing over, right? It, it's, it's almost like you don't know how ad money works, Tom. <laughs> well, I know how it works, but I... <laughs> anyways. So let's get on to his politics, Johnny, because at this point, he's not really welcomed in Princeton, and they're kind of like, we're kind of fed up with you. So he's got greater aspirations, right? Hey, I got to get out of this place and uh, command because bigger things. Johnny, he felt, and I'm not making this up, he felt that anybody who could speak good had a, had a duty, a duty and a right to be in a position of power. I mean, a right, I think, more so than the duty, probably. Well, Johnny, it's that time in every show that we have to make a comparison. <laughs> I know who was it was that people, people. Are you telling me there is? Are you telling me that there is somebody else in history who's a great orator and felt like he deserved a position in power? Was there another person <laughs> similar to that in some sort of way? And I'm gonna go ahead and say it, Johnny. Woodrow Wilson is the first Hitler. <laughs> I mean, everything bad that we think about Hitler, this guy's doing, actively doing. So it sounds like he's the first, but less successful. Less successful, yeah. Well, it depends on how you want to judge that. History still holds him up on it. There are still statues guess, of Woodrow Wilson. I don't believe there I are still statues true. of Hitler put up by any government. I mean, yeah. there might be some kook in his basement, but not. Yeah, so, so Hitler, had, you know, so he had the same idea. He just, he just took it a little bit further. Took a little bit further, yep. A little too far. So in 1910, he's going to run for governor of New Jersey as a Democrat because he's from the South, and that's the party of the South as of right. now. Yeah. Obviously, right. things change, but as of the 1900s, the Democrats are in the South. He would promptly be fired from Princeton University because, well, you cannot campaign while you're actively holding a job as a president of a university. Like, you can't. Most places that my job as a government employee, I cannot campaign while being a government employee. Just the way I it mean, is. So like they basically make you quit your job in government in order to be paid <laughs> to get another by, job in government. To be paid by the people who fund the government. Which yes. are the lobbyists. Obviously. Yes. Okay. I think what really boiled it down to is that they were looking for an excuse to fire him. Yep. Yeah. Here's your excuse. Yeah, because I'm, I'm guessing there have been plenty of people in positions where they were not supposed to campaign, and they campaign, and then the companies are like, oh, that's fine, as long as you just don't do anything crazy or leave the company. Don't campaign on their property or whatever. Yeah. Bad or, yeah. yeah. Uh, he would get elected governor of New Jersey as a Democrat and said that it was, was his moral responsibility to continue this path all the way up to the White House. It, that Having this idea that you have a moral obligation or responsibility for not for like individual things like you have a moral obligation to go to your sister's wedding or whatever but for like he had like this idea in his head that he was something special and had this higher power and higher purpose that he needed and people like that are horrifying yes yes johnny yes they are so he immediately ran for president in the 1912 election as a democrat now, I cannot stress this enough. In a normal election, he would have had absolutely no chance of winning. Okay, so what was going on? 1912, what was going on? Uh, Why was it a weird election? And I got to really stress how little chance he had, Johnny. The last Democrat to be elected was over 60 years ago. Okay, well, law of statistics is going to tell you that's got to end soon, right? It's got to end soon, right? The problem is the Republican Party at this time was having a little bit of an infighting. Teddy Roosevelt wasn't a big fan of the, of the incumbent Taft. Teddy and Roosevelt decided, of the teddy bear? Yeah, Teddy Roosevelt of the teddy bear. Yeah. Oh, great. I know so him. he decided to run for president again, but he would do it this time underneath the, as, a, as a bull moose party. He created his own political party, and the mm. idea was, <laughs> I'm going to sweep this shit. And what he did is he split the vote. Yeah. Well, I... <sighs> We're, we're not a democracy. We're a two-party system. 
Like mm-hmm. any time a third party comes into play and gains any ground, all they do is give it to one or one party or the other because they take half of one of them away. Well, not half. They take 10% of one of them away. Yeah. Well, and that's what happened. Wilson will win the election in a landslide electoral college vote. Which is meaningless. Because you split, he, they, he took yeah. every state because everybody was picking between Right. All the Democrats were still going to vote for him. Yeah. But the so Republicans he, he probably, now split between two different parties. He probably got approximately 50, like 45 to 55% of the vote, right? You're not too far. 42% is what he actually got of the vote. Yeah. yeah. So the majority of the country who voted said, we don't want him. Yeah. <laughs> but that didn't matter. If only, if only this were a de- two other guys. Well, if only this were a democracy. Well, what or if we had like a, a ranking system or like, this is my number one candidate. This is my number two candidate. This is my number three candidate. Like that would have yeah. probably prevented his election as well. Right. Because people would have been like, either of these Republicans are fine. It doesn't. And he becomes the first Democrat elected in 60 years. Well, it sounds like he has some groundwork to lay. He has some expectations to set. He has to really make an impact with his presidency. And oh shit, Johnny does he. Right off the bat, he creates this new idea of new liberalism, which is still pretty much the liberal party's, you know, the Democrat party's goal. And it's not a bad goal on paper. Oh, I mean, communism's not bad on paper. Right. And basically what it means is that they want to expand the federal government's rights of controls in order to ensure the protection of the individual rights of citizens. So new liberalism as an ideal isn't bad. I'm going to make the federal government bigger to ensure that you still have your right to freedom of speech. The problem comes if you make that federal government bigger and you ignore that you were supposed to do that to protect people's rights. Well, I mean, that's, that's what you sell it as. That's never the intention. You want the federal government to be bigger so you can do things like, gosh, I don't know, what, let's think of some ridiculous uh, scenario. Like, I don't know, people are protesting somewhere and you want to send in federal agents to arrest people for that. Like, that's why you want to make the federal government bigger. Of course, I mean, that's just some crazy hypothetical. That wouldn't happen in America. Not but, America. you know, that, that's what can get out of control if, if the federal government gets too much power. There has never been a protest in which innocent people have been arrested and hauled off in unmarked vehicles and no, no, as, as no, as law enforcement in what? America, you have to identify yourself. Like it's that's the law. That's Hong, yeah, that's Hong Kong. That's not that's yeah. not here, right? Thank goodness. Oh man! So right off the bat, he attacks the tariffs, Johnny, because well, we knew that he didn't like tariffs, and he's yeah. going after tariffs yeah. now. Yeah. Now the flag behind me again. If you're not if you're not watching on the YouTube, but if you're listening, I have the Whiskey Rebellion flag behind me. And the Whiskey Rebellion all happened because the government was trying to supplement taxes uh, from the tariffs by adding in a tax on domestically produced liquors, specifically whiskey. It didn't go over well. The people fought it. So pretty much up to this point, the vast, 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 vast majority of the money coming into the federal government was tariffs. If you ship something out, you ship something in, we're going to tax it. Yeah. Great. So the burden of paying taxes to the government falls on the employer, those that are producing the goods or those that are coming, having them shipped in to sell them. Right. So it all falls on the employer. And I'm guessing those employers are like, oh, man, that really stinks. I'm not going to be able to have such a high salary anymore. Right. So the 16th Amendment was actually passed prior to Wilson's you know, administration, so I can't give him credit for that. But I have to give him credit for how it's implemented because he is the first seated, you know, seating president to actually oversee the 16th Amendment and its impl- you know, implementation. And what the 16th Amendment is, if you're a foreigner or if you grew up in the American education system and weren't educated. I was, actually, I was actually just getting ready to ask you what the 16th Amendment was. <laughs> It basically allows the federal government to have a federal income tax. Ah, okay. So now we're going to, you know, we're going to tax the employee. Right. Yeah, of course. So Wilson ran with that, Johnny, and he implemented what is our current 
fluctuating tax system that we have where you pay taxes based on how much you earn. And on paper, it looks like the rich people pay more taxes because they have a higher percentage, but you're totally ignoring the fact that 20% out of $1,000 is a hell of a lot more money than a person has $1,000 than 40% out of $100,000. Right. Yeah. Huge difference. But you can thank Wilson for that. His administration put that up. He also took the tariffs from around 55% at their height of the whole federal government's income and dropped them down to 15% during his administration. The lowest point that tariffs had gotten up to that point. I bet that made several very specific people very happy. Very happy, right? And now what it did is it made the burden of the federal government's finances from the employer to yeah. the employee, which is where it sits today. <laughs> is, is, is this where our, uh, all of our modern day wage theft, slave, you know, pseudo slave labor from corporations comes from? Yeah, it didn't help anything, Johnny. Of course, it's <laughs> also Marxist ideology bullshit. But anyways, well, that's a, that. Damn it, Johnny, you do this to me all the time. That's a story for another time. I can talk about that bullshit. But anyways. All right, stay on topic. Stay we on topic. This. He also would create the Federal Reserve Act, uh, which created the Federal Reserve. So up to this point, there was a independent, non-federal banking system. He created the Federal Reserve, which, on one hand, expanded the federal government's reach into finances, yeah. while single-handedly also giving those banks even more independence to operate outside of federal oversight. Ah, that's always a good thing. So the Federal Reserve was supposed to stop panics from like 1907 when the economy hit the shithole the federal reserve is supposed to prop up the dollar and make sure that no matter what happens business-wide across the world or in the united states the federal government is going to make sure that there is no panic johnny and and ever since this was implemented from wilson there has never been another panic again well that's great because i'm just thinking of some weird hypothetical situation where maybe the entire economy shuts down for i don't know three to six months and businesses start failing everywhere. And it's good to know that the Federal Reserve exists to keep our economy afloat in case some weird hypothetical thing like that would ever happen, which, crazy, I mean, it's not right? going to, but no, it's, it's good to know that the Federal Reserve is there not, to protect us. It's not happened twice in the last 15 years. Huh. Hmm. Weird. Johnny, he would create the Federal Trade Commission that made it easier to break up monopolies. Now, ah, on the FTC. paper, that sounds amazing, right? Yeah. You're going to break up a- monopolies yeah, through the corporations, except through the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was an amendment to this Federal Trade Commission. He allowed utility companies and other categorized things to operate as a monopoly. So if you're sitting at huh. home wondering why Duke Energy, and I say Duke Energy because it's the one that's in Indiana, uh, yeah. is your only source for electricity, well, that's because it's federally protected monopoly that Wilson set up. Let me tell you how I learned about that, Tommy. I was uh, had a door-to-door salesman come to my door, and he wanted to sell me a new tin hat for my roof some sort of insulation thing. They basically put foil up in it or whatever. Anyway, I bought it because I'm a sucker and I buy everything that people come to sell me. Uh, But anyway, he was talking to me and he asked me uh, when we moved in our house, he's like, so when you moved in, uh, you know, who did you choose for your electric provider? And I just looked at him and I'm like, oh, just whoever the the previous owners had because I didn't think anything of it. And he's like, oh, I was kidding because you don't have an option on that. And I'm like, wait, what? I don't have an option. I figured it'd just be easier just to keep what the previous owners had, so I did that. But I, I, I can't choose. Why is Duke Energy sending me advertisements if I can't choose? Have you ever also wondered, like, when you see advertisements for, like, say, Comcast yeah. uh, on the TV, and you go, oh, well, that sounds like a really good deal. I would love to have Comcast in my home. And then when you go and you check to see if Comcast in your area, it says a big old fat no, you've got to go with Bright House. Uh well, I've not had that because I live in Fishers, Indiana, and I literally have okay, like vice versa. You say there's you had you had <laughs> right, I don't, 
<laughs> well, I don't even think Bright House exists anymore or whatever the hell that is. But anyways, your utilities are set. So right. this district has this. It's why the only internet that I can get at my house is Frontier. And that's a whole episode on its own for why I hate fucking Frontier. Well, I mean, I can sum it up pretty easily. Uh, they don't have any competition, so they don't have to care. <laughs> exactly. I still have <laughs> my internet coming through a phone line through DSL. So uh, wah, wah, welcome wah. back, 2003. <laughs> Fast internet in 2003. Not so but bad. yeah, I was going to say peak internet 2003, really. <laughs> not so much anymore. Any case, enough of the whole antitrust crap. He was also the very first president to do a movie screening at the White House. Kind of cool, right? Yeah. You know, watch movies in the All White right. House, hang out in the White House, watch maybe Star Wars or something. It's 1915 that he does I, I, this I doubt Star Wars. Can you, well, it wasn't Star Wars. Can you guess the movie that he showed in 1915? I guarantee you you can't because what the hell movies were in 1915. Hitler's List. <laughs> a bit early. A bit early. It would have been a good one. <laughs> no, he showed the movie Birth of a Nation. Oh, okay. Now, if you're not familiar what Birth of a Nation was, They're or not. is, you're not, it is a movie glorifying the KKK <laughs> and how they <laughs> valiantly fought against Reconstruction during the post-Civil War era and were protecting the white people from the black people that were going to rise up against them. How brave of them. Right? He showed this movie <laughs> in the White House... <laughs> with guests it wasn't like he watched it on his own no 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 johnny he brought people in and said check out this movie well oh, you know he watched way. it on his own first and he's like after he watched it on his own he's like okay guys you have to see this this is amazing this is he this is true history praised the film now there is a quote that he allegedly said about this movie which i'm not gonna there's speculation as to whether or not he actually said that so i'm gonna ignore that quote okay. instead i'm gonna pull the quote that's actually in the movie from woodrow wilson so birth of a nation a undeniably racist piece of shit film yep. glorifying the kkk which by the way at this point in time kkk doesn't exist ulysses s grant killed the kkk off Right. He so made, this he is declared the that they were a terrorist organization, got rid of them. In this movie, glorifying the KKK, it is quoted from Woodrow Wilson's American People History book, and I quote, the policy of the congressional leaders wrought a variable overthrow of civilization in the South and their determination to put the white South under the heel of the black South. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it seems to me like uh these uh kkk guys really did their job um because i don't know if you've been to the south uh but it is not under the heel of the black man it is in it any, is most definitely not in any way shape or form so i no. guess mission accomplished now because of his acceptance of this film and because of the popularity of the birth of the nation which was partly in due to the fact that it was shown in the i mean could you imagine like the white house net well <laughs> Could you imagine the White House like 10 years ago showing a movie and being like, listen, this is the president's favorite movie. Like it would give that movie some some degree of merit. Oh, well, right? oh, okay. so about that, um, Barack Obama's book list. Yes, put, great example. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah. there's, there's a guy that I follow, Shay Serrano, who he's uh, author and, and everything, but he wrote a book about – um, I can't. I can't remember. I think it was a rap yearbook or something. But Barack Obama put it. He said, "This is one of the books you should check out this summer." And now, because of that, this dude's a three-time New York Times best-selling author because Obama put him on the map. Like that's sure the power did. of the White House. Like you have at least half of a country around there who are going to see something you, yeah. you say and be like, "Okay, yeah, I'll check that out." Well, Johnny, because of the popularity of Birth of the Nation, because Woodrow Wilson gave it a nod of approval, the second rising of the KKK happens. Hooray! Weird! By the way, they also will die out, and we're now on the third rising. Of I, was, the I was actually going to ask which rising we were on. I wasn't sure we're if on the, it was the third We're, the we're on the third. We're on the third. Uh, the second rising of the KKK has a good good history in Indiana, too. So, you know, yeah, oh, yeah. Indiana. Yeah. 
Yeah. Fucking, fucking Indiana. Elwood. Woo, woo. Don't go to Martinsville if you're, you know, darker Ooh, than God. in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have any listeners from Martinsville, but if I do, well, you know who you are, so whatever. I mean, yeah. They, good, he I'm, would I'm expand surprised the they got Crow, the internet. So the Dream Crow laws exist in the South. He would expand those into the federal government. Now, believe it or not, up until this point, the federal government was the best chance that an African-American had to have any kind of equal shake with employment. Like getting a job with the federal government? Yeah, with the federal government. Like working at the post office, you know. Working at the IRS. Well, the FBI doesn't exist, but those those don't exist yet. Oh, what? Those don't exist yet, (laughs) but they will. They will. (laughs) At least one of those will. (laughs) Does he he, he bring one of those to us? He sure does. Uh, I can't wait to find out which one. Uh, so, you know, if you if you are an African American, this is really your best shot at, at having equal employment. But, but when when Woodrow Wilson gets elected, and he's a Southerner, a bunch of people who sympathize with him say, "Hey, look, we think that there's a little bit of a problem going on right now in the federal government, in that we have African Americans with whiteies and their button heads because you know." One's oil and one's vinegar, and they don't mix. Yeah, yeah. So instead of having this, like, you know, clash of personalities, clash of cultures that, you know, interrupt the workflow, why don't we separate them? Ah, huh. that makes and sense. And Woodrow Wilson True. said, yeah, of that course. sounds perfect. I'm going to solve race relations issues by just separating everybody. Yeah. You just don't let the races see each other, and then how can you have an issue? Right. So he starts to segregate the federal workforce. And you might be wondering yourself, there are going to be bound to be positions where you can't really logistically separate workers. I mean, if you're working on tax code in an office, like we're going to build a whole new office for five guys at this point. So what happens in those situations where you can't separate them, Johnny? Well, one of two things happened with, with Woodrow Wilson. He either had them fired so, and by them, I mean the African-Americans, not the white guys, but the African-Americans. Well, I mean, or, I'm, guessing, I'm guessing equally it's one or the other, depending on which one was fewer, right? Because, obvi- I mean, obviously we're trying to make things equal, even if they are separate. Sure. Uh, or he literally, oh. Johnny, and I'm not making this up, literally put cages around them and their workstation. So you would have a, an office with desks and he would put a cage over the black guy's desk. I, the, we are literally caging a person that could have been a slave themselves or their parents were a slave and we're going right. to cage them while they're at work i i don't even have anything for that like that well, although to be fair there were industries like the the private industries were like literally chaining people to their workstations too and by people, I mean everybody. But that's that's because OSHA hadn't existed yet. Why do people long for the past? <laughs> I don't know. What the actual fuck? It was terrible. Uh, unless you're you know, unless you're a top one percent, it was bad. And Johnny, he would extend all of his racist ideology into his foreign policy, which he deemed Wilsonianism, which is still going on today. <laughs> oh, it is still like the predominant foreign policy that happens today again any 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 policy that that starts named with person's after you? name and then just puts ism at the end of it is it, not going to be a fair and just and good policy <laughs> no it's not <laughs> basically wilsonianism says that american values should be spread throughout foreign policy essentially american values should be spread globally and the america should assist nations in spreading democracy this is the idea that we want to make the world safe for democracy. So it's the crusades. This is the crusades. This is the crusade. And this is what we still do today. Yeah. We still do it today. Yeah. Even the last administration still did it. Oh, no. Yeah. This is, this, ideology. this is a core part of American history. This is this a core point. part of American. And it is Wilson who develops it. All right. So you want to know why we invaded Korea during the Korean War? Wilsonianism. Mm. Want to know why we invaded Vietnam during the Vietnam War? Conflict. Wilsonianism. Want to know why we invaded Grenada during Grenada? Wilsonianism. I don't know. Want to know why we're in the Middle East? 
Well, partly Oil. because somebody's dad couldn't finish the war, but also Wilsonian is. <laughs> uh, Although that one was the oil. The... And the oil. Okay. Well, the whole spread of the world make it safe for democracy. It's always, the, the money is always uh-huh. the underlying. Is, is that what makes democracy <laughs> safe? Yeah, that's, that's what makes democracy <laughs> safe. During his administration, he wouldn't hear at the Philippine-American War. So we can't blame him for the Philippine-American War. And that's a derivative of the Spanish-American War. Watch our episode on that. It was great. Uh, in which we gained Philippines as a colony, and they didn't like that because we told them that we wouldn't take them as a colony, but we did anyways, yeah. and they fought against us. It's like we won't accept you, but we'll take you. So he would, inv- yeah, he would, yeah, he would, uh, he would continue that war. He would invade Nicaragua. Why? Because we want to make it safe for democracy. Oh, okay, right. He would invade Haiti and occupy Haiti because he wants to make like it safe for, for democracy. Yeah, for freedom. Yep, got it. He would invade the Dominican Republic for and freedom. Occupy it for freedom. Yeah. And and what it really was is that we wanted to control the import exports out of these nations because they all have like things like sugar that we want. What? Weird. And American people like sugar? And tobacco. And they're discovering it in the early nineteen hundreds, nineteen ten. It's weird. And huh. oh yeah, Johnny, you know what? He would also invade Mexico because... Didn't we already do that war? We did that war, but he would do it again. And, and are you noticing a trend that I said here? Notice what? a trend. What are yeah. all these nations have in common? I mean, they're all third world. Yeah, okay. And? Um, they have a lot of natural resources. And? Um, Mexico has Coca-Cola that uses real sugar instead of Splenda and artificial well, they, they do, Yeah, that is true. They do have some good Coke. They're all brown, Johnny. None oh. of these nations are white nations. He's not invading any 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 white areas. No, no, no. Only well, what, do you Latin want him to go out to Iceland? Like, what, what, did, what resources do they have? You want to know why he doesn't invade uh, white nations? Why did, why did people start to gain white or less pigment and become white. It's because they moved north into the colder climates. You know what doesn't happen in the colder climates? Anything with resources. That's why Europe had to travel all around the friggin' world taking everybody else's resources because they can't produce shit on their own. Hi. Was that... Shh. No? Is that not true? No, I mean, I'm surprised that you probably got off the mark there. <laughs> I mean, really... He declared that the Mexican government was illegitimate because at this point they are having a revolution and have had a revolution for years. He would support Pancho Villa in the revolution until Pancho Villa turned around and invaded several of our cities across the border. And we can't have that, Johnny. The brown person turned against us. We're going we're gonna to quash that. So he has this punitive expedition into Mexico, which went oh so well. And it will be an episode on its own at a later, later date. <laughs> And we wonder why Germany in the Zimmergram uh, or Zimmerman telegram uh, tried to encourage Mexico to go to war with us. I mean, we were kind of already at a default state with war with Mexico anyways, but whatever. So, so basically, this is like a middle or like a big brother punching his little brother, right? U.S. punching Mexico. Yeah. And then one of his friends looking and be like, dude, hit him back. <laughs> You are right, Johnny. Now it's time for his re-election. We're now up to nineteen seven or nineteen sixteen ish time frame. He's gotta get reelected, right? The whole Mexican intervention thing's going on and <laughs> maybe people aren't really super happy because most Americans at this point don't want us involved in shit. They right. want us to just be isolationists. Yeah, can we can we just be America and not deal with anybody else? And World War One is going on, Johnny, and up to this point he attempted to create peace. In World War One, he attempted to go and be a negotiator to peace uh, with all the fighting powers, and nobody listened to him. Because why would you? I mean, right? Yeah. He claimed that he was a neutral party during World War One, and I have to stress that he was not a neutral party. The United States was at no point in time ever a neutral party because normally, when you're a neutral party, you have certain agreements, like I'm not going to trade military equipment to any warring party. That's the fair thing to do. Isn't Switzerland like the only ever actually neutral party? There's been a couple, but yes, yeah, they're one. Basically, it's Switzerland, um, and they didn't. They don't trade like they don't give guns or munitions or any war aid to anybody. They give you bank loans. 
<laughs> Which oh, you can I mean, talk about how Switzerland isn't, but that's uh, an episode for a later yeah, date. Yeah, we'll now, get into Switzerland later. you also don't, if you trade a box of Cheerios with, say, Germany, you would trade a box of Cheerios with England because that's the fair thing to do. Right. Now, I, I don't know why everybody's so into Cheerios, but sure, I get it. It's just the, the ham's oh, just, beer. You, just you an trade example. ham's beer with, okay. with Germany. You got to trade a ham's <laughs> beer with, with, uh, with England. I wouldn't. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> or it's cheap and it gets you drunk, so whatever. Six in now, one, half a dozen in the other. What Wilson did is he allowed uh, the Entente powers to bring armed vessels to the United States coast to pick up military equipment to then in turn ship back to their countries, which they will use against the central powers, which is, you know... Germany. And then he did not do that for Germany. And he did not do that no. for the Germans. Yeah. He cried foul when the German U boat sunk the Lusitania. Right. Which why would you do that, Germany? Shipping like two thousand tons of weapons and munitions to England from us. And, huh. and the Germans didn't like that? And the Germans and they, didn't like that. And they took action against it? And they took action against it. I'm sorry, did they know that it was American? Like, yeah, well, it wasn't even an American boat. We just had some Americans on a British boat. Oh, well, that's our fault then. Should have just sent American made. Wouldn't have sunk. And at this point in time in American history, we do have a very, 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 very large German immigrant population. In yeah. fact, out of immigrant population, it's like number two. Like you've got the yes. English Isles and then you have Germany. Right. So you have hello Pennsylvania. You, you have US citizens, <laughs> yeah, right? Pennsylvania Dutch. You have US citizens that are, you know, very much split on this war, which is why we want to stay independent. So the election comes up. And the election isn't about who's going to get us in the war, who's not. It's about who's going to leave us more independent and more neutral. Now, if anybody was actually paying any damn bit of attention to what the hell was going on, they would have gone, "Oh, we want to go with the other dude that clearly hasn't violated neutrality laws but they don't for whatever reason probably because it's always easier to elect an incumbent follow, he, follow he your heart re-elected. tony huh? follow, you follow your heart follow your heart he That's gets reelected real. on the premise that i'm going to keep us out of war <laughs> and then immediately declares war <laughs> on the central powers well you know he tried it's just that after he already got elected again and realized he couldn't get elected for a third time, the desire now, and, and opportunity was just too great. When he declares war, he knows it's not a – and by he, I mean, he does have to get congressional approval, so I'm – Right. No, yeah, this, this wasn't a lone decision. He's not a dictator. This is America, after all. So when he does declare war, he knows it's not a popular decision. War rarely is. There's going to be a large percentage of the population that's going to speak out against them. Yeah, I think that's pretty standard. So to curb that, he creates the Espionage Act. Ah. So you want to know why you can't scream bomb on a plane, Johnny? Uh, I was pretty sure that you can. Um, there's just no, it is, it some is actually, consequences. Yeah, it's, it's illegal. You can't say bomb on a – you can't scream bomb on a plane. Well, I can it's do pretty much anything. It's just now there are consequences for yeah, it. Yeah, there's consequences. Yeah. Well, and the reason why there are consequences are because in 1918, the Supreme Court, in its stupidity, declared that the Espionage Act was constitutional. Now, on its face, it's not necessarily something that's so intrinsically awful to the First Amendment. But the problem is the Espionage Act essentially makes it illegal to speak out against the war. Or to incite riots. So that's why you can't say fire in a – if there's not a fire and you can't say Right, you can't in, inciting panic and all that sort of sort of jazz. Um, and, but this was – so I understand why, obviously, I think it's a good thing that you can't just start screaming random things whenever you want because that would be chaos. But what, what part of it made it illegal to speak out against the war? The Espionage Act, because well, but did it like was it just language specifically in it? 
According to the Supreme Court, protesters to the war deemed a clear and present danger to the United States because it interfered with war efforts that were necessary for the United States. In any sort of protest, like they say protest of the war, which currently I war, think of actual protest because of where we're at right now, but protest of the war can be anything from actual protests, sitting in, sit-ins or whatever, to just saying I'm against this war in a public conversation. Well, saying I'm against this war in a public conversation wasn't illegal yet under the Espionage Act, but Wilson okay. didn't like that. So he created an amendment to the Espionage Act called the Sedition Act, which made it far more strong for the Espionage Act and made it literally illegal and a prosecutable offense to write, speak, print anything that could be deemed as anti-government, anti-war, anti-military, or anti-president. That's literally what the First Amendment protects, right? Yep. Am I, the am I, Act, yeah, the Sedition Act took that and threw it in the dumpster. Could you imagine and, today if we were walking around and it was illegal to say Trump's an orange Cheeto? Yeah, I mean, 75% of the country would be in jail would right be in jail. now. Now, for those at home, it is a good thing the Sedition Act was repealed in 1920. But we still how, so have, how long was it active then? From 1918 to 19, two years. Okay. So during the, during the basically the war periods and immediately mm. after the war period. Okay, sure. Basically, Woodrow Wilson's second term is when it was. Yeah, he's, he said, I don't what? want people saying mean things about me. <laughs> and so but he that, passed a law against it, basically. Yeah, but that Espionage Act, it's still in the force today. Heavily right. modified, so you can't get arrested for saying war is awful. Right. Yeah. But so still, it basically it pared it down to the things that are reasonable where you can't say I have a bomb on an airplane. You can't say scream fire in a movie theater yeah, and things yep. like that. Like yep, 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 where yep, you would incite yep. riots or violence or just chaos and anarchy. Now, out of this military act, Johnny, he created well, he utilized the military intelligence, which already existed. He would go on to create a spy network of U.S. citizens, which were around 250,000 at their height, called the, the American Protective League. Ah, yes, yes. And he anything, would also use... Anything named with the word, like, American or uh, United States... Just the Patriot the, Act. The, this, yeah, this very patriotic-type name thing. It's like, beware of nationalism. Yeah, you know, peop, you know they're naming that. So that people don't think twice about it. They see the name, they're like, that must be good. I'm a patriot. I, yes, I love this country. So go ahead, pass the Patriot Act. Of course I'm a patriot. Pass it. Wait, you're, you're looking at what now? Right. He would also use the Bureau of Investigations, which would become the FBI, Johnny. Hey, there it is. Hoover himself got his start from this. There was actually even a special division of these spies that would spy on American citizens. So they, these are the guys going around like, my neighbor, <laughs> the witch hunts, my yeah. neighbor said you said you, he called you a poo poo head. So we yeah. got to arrest him. Yeah, I heard, I heard, my, my, heard my neighbor say something negative about the president. By the way, a thousand, at least a thousand people would be convicted during the Sedition Act. Under the Sedition Act, Jesus. a thousand people would be convicted and arrested. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but still, it's a thousand people getting arrested for voicing their rights to freedom of speech, which yeah. is a constitutionally protected right. Yeah, it's 1,000 instances of First Amendment violation conducted which, by the President of the United States. You might be States. sitting at home thinking the Espionage Act was, was, was constitutionally protected by the Supreme Court, which it was. The Sedition Act wasn't, which is what these people were being arrested for. Right. And it was repealed because it would never have actually stood up. Yeah, because the they, they're like, wait, what the f you You want to do what? To who? To what? They can just anything? No, we can't, can't do, do that. that. There was a special division uh, of, of, uh, of, of, you know, this group that was formed under these, these U.S. spies on U.S. citizens. So like the Green the, Berets of uh, this yeah, the special new division investigation. That was devoted to, and I'm quoting, so don't get mad at me for using <laughs> words. Negro subversion. Ooh. This directly led to an increase in lynchings during 1917 to 1920. For, for, for a three-year period, there was a literal lynching epidemic where 
we would go around and lynch black people because we thought they were anti-American. But to be fair, we also lynched Germans because they're clearly, you know, Nazis, but before Nazis. Hey, uh, just quick point. I don't think, I, I, I don't think that helps. No, it doesn't. Because it doesn't. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that to be fair uh, makes any part of this fair, Tommy. No, it doesn't. We <laughs> lynched a shit ton of people from God. 1917 to 1920 because they were anti-war and black. Yeah, and again, 40 to and, 50 and years later. And let me rephrase later. that. They were just black. It yeah. Had nothing no. to do with their political stance. It was because they were black. It was, it was because they were black living, walking, breathing, or existing in the wrong area of the world. In the South. Or Martinsville. <laughs> As the case may be, As you know, Elwood was actually the capital of the Indiana yeah, they, KKK Indiana yeah, for a yeah, while. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, War, I War, don't know that because I was a part of it. I know that because I live in Indiana. You're fine. <laughs> like it's just it's common would. knowledge. I just want to point that out. it's common knowledge here. Yeah. Like I just want to make that clear that I'm not like, oh, you know, back I used to drive up to Elwood every weekend and like you know, <laughs> the birds of grass. It wasn't that. No, it wasn't. Uh, so in World War I, he created this 14-point plan, which I'm not going to read the 14 points, and on paper it sounds pretty good, but essentially what it is is it's supposed to encourage nations to self-govern and make their own decisions. Wait, but he's also Mr. I'm going to go around the world and spread our democracy. Well, it's making it safe for democracy in the countries that want democracy. Well, or, or the countries that don't, and we want to make sure that they will have democracy. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Johnny, because you know what was going on in 1917 in Russia? I, you know I don't. I know you don't. <laughs> but there's a little bit of a revolution that was going on in 1917 in Russia. Oh, no. where a bunch of Russians thought communism was a good idea, and a bunch of Russians thought, no, I don't like communism. And then a bunch of Russians thought, well, what's wrong with the king? Or the czar. Sorry. Czar. Right. King. Same thing. Oh, the czar is so much more fun to say. Well, the United States, during World War I, in order to protect the Russian people, invaded and occupied huge chunks of Russia. So much, too, in the point where that on Armistice Day, you know, November 11th, uh, at 11 a.m. or 11 p.m., I think it was 11 p.m., in 1918, when, when the world says we're going to be done with war, the United States is fighting... Russian citizens on Russian soil because they want to be communist and we don't like that idea. That's not safe for democracy, Johnny. No. Um, it kind of goes against the whole like let them self govern thing, doesn't it? Like, do we get to go back and be like, I told you so though? Or <laughs> like yeah. does it no? I don't I don't know if they're faring any better underneath their democracy now. Oh wait, they're a democracy they're now? Yeah, they're yeah, yeah. Oh, really? I mean, Putin's only been the president for the last, what, 20 years? <laughs> I, I literally... I am not saying anything anti-Russian. I love you, Putin. I would love to have a vodka with you or a beer. I don't know what your drink of choice is, but whatever your drink of yes, choice is, I, mean, it's I, would, be vodka, I, would, right? I would share it with Putin. Uh, nah, I don't know. You know I don't think he gives a shit enough to come to my house. You know, he probably wouldn't. And I don't really have any desire to go to, although I do want to go to Red Square and yeah. uh, go to the McDonald's and have a, a Big Mac at the McDonald's on Red Square because I think it's just funny. Yeah, well, and there are also some fantastically beautiful places in Russia. It's just that it's such a large country that 90% of it's just like a frozen tundra hellscape. But uh like P P uh, St. petersburg or st petersburg or whatever yeah, like petersburg, yeah yeah you with all like, the they have all the cat like the towers and everything that are yeah, you don't want to go to like, siberia Sib I, i'd be all right with it like i like frozen tundra hellscapes like that's that's where i exist in my most natural form you are a hobbit so you know yeah that's what that's, that's what all this hair <laughs> damn it johnny warm. we're going long on this episode no this one no uh, getting too back on track Getting back on track. Uh, I mean, how much more shit can this guy do? Well, not a lot, but we're, we're, we're grinding it down. So he also had a goal of creating a League of Nations to make the world safe for the American democracy. I assume this is different than the League of Legends that was created yeah, later and yeah, became a, a video game. And it makes, the, it makes the, the United Nations, I mean, they would be envious of the League of Nations. Yeah. Um, but the American people, so he spent his last basically year in presidency trying to push this whole League of Nations idea. 
Okay. And the American people were like, yeah, no, we don't want that. And at no point in time did the United States ever sign a treaty to join the League of Nations. And we also refused to sign the Treaty of Versailles because it kind of violated every single one of the 14 points that Wilson put in place. Although Wilson himself kind of liked the Treaty of Versailles that made Germany pay for the war and, you know, drew up new lines in the Middle East well, the good France that would not have any consequences that would extend on to the day. No, it's it's really good that they sorted out the entire Middle East after World War One, and really just, you know, they said, hey, you get this, you get this, you get this, you get this. Oh, you all want that area? It doesn't matter. We gave it to one person. Hope that doesn't come back to bite us in the ass. Uh, well, that, one person, that, was, that, was, that was World War II that we gave them that one. Oh, that, that was World War II? We hadn't even dealt with that yet? No, we haven't. We, yeah, we didn't set, you know, we didn't split up Jerusalem yet. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Well, there you go. But anyway, but during, but they, during they, World War they One, defined the countries. We, that's when we made Iraq, Iraq, yeah, and okay. took three warring parties and made them one country, and then gave each other the each other's land, and then wondered why they were fighting to get each other's land. Anyways, I mean, the United States sorted their shit out when we had a civil war. Why can't they? <laughs> yeah, we're still not arguing about that. One hundred and fifty. Be better, Middle later. East. Do better. He would also suffer a lot of strokes during his presidency, and his last oh. major ones kind of happened during the last couple of years. And there's rumor that his, his remarried wife took over a lot of his duties because he strokes was a little, will mess you up. He was a little vegetably. Yeah, I mean, strokes like, I mean, it's your brain like short circuiting. <laughs> I have like, no illicit ramifications for my stroke, Johnny. Oh, no, I'm sure not. I don't remember too good. <laughs> so I have to have all these notes, and they say uh a lot. So if you're all making sand- fun of me at All home, my sandwiches taste like aluminum. If know, you're making fun of me at home for saying uh, feel like an asshole because I had a stroke. <laughs> uh, spoiler alert. Did the same thing before the stroke. That was chemo brain, though, Johnny. So oh, sh- God. I always right. have an excuse. You know, I have but- cancer and a stroke, and at the age of 35, I have more health ailments than I think a 90-year-old man does. You're going to make me put my foot in my mouth again because of your cancer? Uh, yeah. Good times. I forgot I made you do that in college. That was yeah, it's, it's because I saw your driver's license and made fun of you for being bald. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I had cancer. <laughs> oh. Hey, but it's fine because I put my foot in, in my mouth when I was like, well, why are you bitching about not getting laid? You got a girlfriend at home and then you like literally just broke up with her. <laughs> oh, yeah, there was that. Well, you know. It happens. Oh, well. In any case, so basically his last <laughs> year of presidency, year and a half, was pretty much a lame duck where he got absolutely nothing accomplished. And and I have to reiterate that there was absolutely nothing wrong going on in 1919 where maybe he should have been a part of something because 1919 might have been a shit year. And by might have been, I mean that, well, women were fighting for the right to vote, which he did nothing about. What a silly plan. The Red Scare was going on where, you know, socialists were being killed in the streets because they were socialists. Wait, I thought it was communists. Yeah, <laughs> that too. <laughs> A lynching epidemic was going on against African-Americans. Right. And he did nothing. Nothing. Yeah, nothing. I, nothing. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to – I'm a very empathetic person and I can travel inside people's brains. I'm going to go ahead and guess why he did nothing. Well, because he um, had nothing going on in his brain. <laughs> Well, I think just none of those things were bad to him. Yeah, well, it was probably that. Like, yeah. oh, we're lynching black people, so what's the problem there, obviously? And women want a right to vote? Maybe let's not help that because why would they want that? And let's be fair. If he did help, his track record wasn't exactly the best to this point. So right. maybe it was good that he sat those ones out. Do you want him as an ally at this point? Like. So to summarize, your 28th president of these United States was an undeniable racist. There is no way anybody can argue that he wasn't racist. Like, even by that day's standards, he was racist. Right. Yeah, even, even by, like, 100 years earlier standards, he right? was racist. His writings helped spur on the lost cause ideology. 
which still exists today and why I have to fight with people about the Confederate flag being hate and not heritage because the flag that you're flying wasn't even the fucking Confederate flag. <laughs> he legitimized the KKK and helped the Second Rising come to power. Hey. You shit on the First Amendment by arresting people for calling him a, yeah. you know, doo-doo head. Yeah. He created utility monopolies that still exist today. He created the federal taxes that still exist today, which make the employer burden all of the fucking tax burden. Hell, corporations paying their fair share. Yeah. He created the foreign policy that justifies U.S. intervention in everything, which still goes on today, which, by the way, if you're a Republican at home, which I'm not saying that's good or bad or wrong or right or whatever. I'm a libertarian, so I have no reason to argue with anybody or every reason to argue with everybody. Anyways, if you're wondering who's to blame for Benghazi, it wasn't Hillary Clinton. It's Woodrow Wilson for putting us there to begin with. Yeah, uh, as as a as a libertarian, I think it's not so much that you argue with either nobody or everybody. I think it's that um, your your beliefs, thoughts, votes, and everything else just happen to not matter at all. In this yeah, they don't matter at all. Just, <laughs> it's yeah, just everybody looks at ah, oh, that's that's okay, that's great. You look, keep thinking that you vote is, down your party line and see what happens, buddy. This is all I'm gonna ask. Don't ask. And it. then we're gonna end this episode. What are we doing? If you're at home and you're not going to vote, all I ask is that you actually do go out and vote, but vote libertarian. You know your vote's not going to matter. They're not going to get elected. But what I hope is that we get 5%. That's all I want. 5% so that we can actually have our candidate on the debate stage, which, again, won't really matter. But I, I want to see somebody else up there. Hey, Tom, if I thought that, that you— might not be sniffing children. If I, if I thought that your voice had any reach at all. I, I, I'd counter it. But alas. <laughs> You're making fun of our own damn show, Johnny. <laughs> well, that is Woodrow Wilson. If you got to this point, which you probably didn't. But if you did, congratulations. Hey, thanks for that. All right, that's it for this week in Historic Hindsight. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review, and join us next week when we talk about New Orleans. New Orleans. Nor we're the battle Nar of New Orleans. We're, we're not just talking about Nolans. We're talking about the battle. Mardi Gras. Yeah. We're yeah. <laughs> the battle of New Orleans. Damn it, Johnny. You're going to get people excited about boobs, and there were going to be no – well, I mean, I might show my boobs. I don't know. But there will be no boobs on the show.